It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. After the podcast, check out everything ChristianQuestions.com has to offer. Also see our weekly video series releases at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Here's your hosts, Rick and Jonathan. Talisa once said, a word of advice is, when you judge someone, it doesn't define the person that you're judging, it defines you. I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. Joining me as always is Jonathan, my co-host for more than two decades. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. Jonathan, what is our topic for today's episode? Is it ever right to judge your brother? Our theme text, Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Wow, that's a pretty big comparison. (laughs) So coming up in today's podcast, judging people is easy, and face it, it can feel like fun as well. But what happens to me when I judge you? Am I better off for it? Find out in about 15 minutes. Even though judging others is not often a good idea, there are times when we absolutely need to. So how do we handle the really hard and necessary judgments? We're going to talk about this in about 30 minutes. And finally, what about things that are important but not principle-based or morally deficient? Do we judge those things? Well, it turns out that we do. And again, you'll find out in about 45 minutes. But first, let's get some context in place. We all make judgments even when we're not thinking about it. If you're listening to this podcast, you are right now deciding whether to keep listening. If you're reading this blog, you're right now considering whether or not to continue reading. And this verifies that judgment is an important exercise because it helps us determine what is worth our time and what is not. And for the record, I believe you will find this podcast a worthy investment of your time, so do stay with us. Now, what about judging others? Ah, this... This is a little trickier. The Bible actually tells us emphatically not to judge others, and with the same passion, it tells us to judge others. Why the seeming doublespeak? Well, it all comes down to two things. Obviously, the what of our judgment is important, but more important, we need to be aware of the why of our judgments. So we've got the what, and we've got the why. There, Jonathan, there are at least seven different words for judge or judgment in the New Testament. We're going to look at some of these words today and their meanings, and we're going to examine examine several pointed teachings on how we should perceive our brother or sister. The first teaching we're going to look at is from Jesus and is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Rick, when I read the title of our subject, Is It Ever Right to Judge Your Brother? I thought, well, who's my brother? First, is this about every human being, the big picture, or is it for those in my circle of friends, family, and neighbors? Or is it for those that claim to be Christians, fans of Jesus? Or is it specifically about followers of Jesus, sacrificial Christians? So I really want to get the context. What is this subject all about? Yes. <laughs> it okay. is it is about all of those things but it is very specifically about judging our the, within the brotherhood. It is it is focused on that but the principles always apply outside of it. So we want to be very particular about dealing with the brotherhood but absolutely yes. Everything else fits into the exact same principles. Good question to get us started. So let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. These are the words of Jesus, and they're very pointed words. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay, a lot there. We want to go through this literally verse by verse. Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Jonathan, those verses you just read, it reveals two great dangers that open the door for inappropriate judgment. The first great danger we're going to talk about is in the first few verses of Matthew chapter 7, and it's arbitrary judgment. That's the danger, and, and that is judging for no, no real valuable reason. 
just just arbitrarily making judgments. So before we get into this verse by verse uh, discussion of Matthew chapter seven, uh, let's go to a story. Uh, we got this from Jay Shetty on YouTube. Before you judge someone, watch this. This is a fascinating story, and all I'm going to say to start is it takes place in an airport. A man was waiting at an airport for a long-distance flight. His flight was delayed, and so he had a little spare time. He saw a deal on some cookies and thought he should treat himself. He bought quite a few cookies because he thought it might be quite a long delay. He took a seat near a man and started to read the magazine he also picked up earlier. He exchanged a glance with the other man and then tried to avoid eye contact as he went back to reading. While he was engrossed in his magazine, he happened to see that the man sitting beside him boldly grabbed a cookie from the container. He initially ignored the incident to avoid a scene. He grabbed a cookie himself and went back to his magazine. Okay, now first of all, it's about cookies, so you know that's a serious thing. It is, especially <laughs> if they're like Oreos. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have this circumstance. We're going to develop this story throughout the podcast, and it's about judging, and it's about arbitrary judging, judging with the right attitude. So we're going to see how this story unfolds about the mysterious cookie thief. Hmm, we'll think about this. All right, <laughs> so verse 1, Matthew 7, verse 1, Jesus begins with a warning. This is a very short verse. What is it? Do not judge so that you will not be judged. And Rick, this word judge means properly to distinguish, that is, decide. So it's a very simple, straightforward, it's kind of the sorting out kind of a judgment. Do not sort out in relation to other people, and you will not, therefore, be sorted out. We're going to see in these scriptures in Matthew 7, as they unfold, Jesus is saying, do not begin to enter into the process of, of arbitrarily judging someone, for that action will trigger judgment back on you. So you can read Matthew 7, verse 1, and you can say, well, Jesus says do not judge. That means do not ever judge anything ever under any circumstance. That's not what he means. He's talking about judgment in a very specific way, and we need to understand that. The context will tell us that. So that is the warning. Don't judge. And we're adding arbitrarily because that's the thought behind it. Now let's look at verse 2. Jesus develops the consequences of this arbitrary judgment. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And that's a different word uh, for judge, and it means a decision, the function of the effect for or against. So it says, for the way that you judge, the way that you decide, you will be judged, and that's the same word as before, you will be sorted out. So it goes from the... The, the second word carries the idea of a decision aspect. Jesus is demonstrating how quickly we go from thinking about someone and their circumstances to deciding about someone and their circumstances in a negative way. This is important. It's subtle, but it's an important aspect of things. So as we go forward now, let's take a break from Matthew chapter 7 just for a few minutes, and let's go to Romans, the second chapter because it's a really, really good supplement to Matthew chapter 7. As a matter of fact, it's, it, it feels like they were written for each other. Romans chapter 1, the context of the beginning of Romans 2, Romans chapter 1 reveals the sinfulness and depravity of humanity in light of God being revealed to them through nature. Okay, it's, It gives them the sense of you've got all of these things to recognize God, and yet you don't, and you are idolatrous. Chapter 2 warns us to not fall into the pattern of the arbitrary judgment that the people in Matthew, in in Romans chapter 1 were involved in, but also of what Jesus is is describing in Matthew 7. So Romans 2 fits very closely with the same focus on arbitrary judgment. Jonathan, let's do Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and we're going to be introduced into yet another word for judgment in this verse. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things, and we know that judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Do, but do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? All right, so... What we have is he's talking about, you don't have an excuse. You see, if you read Romans chapter 1, you're thinking, wow, those people, they're just not paying attention. Wow, they're not being good. Wow, look at at how ungodly that is. And Romans chapter 2 says, 
Therefore, you have a, no excuse, oh man, who passes judgment on everybody else. And it's like, wait, what? What, me? How, how did I get involved in this? And see, Matthew is the same thing. It's like, what? What, me? And it talks about in, in verse 1, you have no excuse because you're passing judgment. You're, you're, you're doing that sorting out uh, and you're, you're judging others. And by doing so, you condemn yourself. So that word for condemn, Jonathan, what does that mean? That means to judge against uh, or sentence. So this is being harsh. By, it is. By, by parsing things out about others, you are actually passing a sentence on yourself. And that's an uh-oh moment if I ever saw one. <laughs> okay, we don't, we don't want that moment here. You know, uh, Paul, Paul here is showing the big picture. He's talking about judging, and it's not just about the brotherhood now. It's about everybody, just like you were asking earlier. So this is a big picture uh, assessment of judgment, not just the brotherhood. Paul is blunt here. When we judge others in a careless and self-unaware way, we bring a harsh sentence upon ourselves, and we give God a panoramic view of our own faulty character. Now, Jonathan, I don't know about you, but I got me a lot of faults. <laughs> <laughs> I have many, 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 and but I'm working on them. And that's the attitude to have. But we can have the faults, but do we want to give God, do we want to lay them out in a panorama so he can just examine them so easily? Wouldn't we rather try to be working on them so they're harder to find? Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> when we involve ourselves in this arbitrary kind of judgment, we're giving God a panoramic view of our own faults. That's what we're doing. And the Apostle Paul is basically saying, oh, you're kind of condemning yourselves here, so you got to be watching, watching what goes on. So just by those two first two verses of Matthew 7, we see there's all kinds of trouble here with inappropriate judgment. So we need to judge our judgments. And here's what we need to ask. When I look at my brother's faults, what do I see. Jonathan, what do I see? I am looking for his faults to use them to prove a point or make myself look better. Do I see him as a valued human being first, or do I see him as a fault-ridden sinner first? Ooh, see, that's, a, that's an interesting, how am I first seeing this brother of mine? That's right, Rick. We, we, all, do, uh, we all do it. We all judge him properly because of our sinful nature. The question is, what do we do about it? We should repent and be on guard to stop the practice. And really, that's the key. It's a simple key, but that's the key. Repent and be on guard to stop it. When there is a sin, we need to not just think about it, we need to stop it. So looking at this, just to get started, the whole idea of judging others without first looking in the mirror and thinking through it is a scary proposition. Now that we know not to look for someone's faults, what is our nature, natural reaction when we see them? Okay. The human mind, and we all know this, is a complex thing. Once we've exposed an issue with another person, it becomes incredibly hard to avoid seeing that person without looking at that issue. It's just like you know, all of a sudden they're just attached to each other. Our natural judgments run with the negative. Jesus is about to tell us that in God's eyes, this approach is destined to backfire. So we need to understand, Jonathan, that when we get that preconceived notion, it sticks with us and it begins to define the way we see that person. And that is not a Christian attitude. No, it's not. And that brings us to the second great danger. Now, the first great danger that we were talking about with this judgment in Matthew 7 is arbitrary judgment, making those arbitrary judgments. The second great danger is fault-finding and fault-magnifying. It's one thing to find faults, and it's a worse thing to magnify them. Let's go back to our story. Before you judge someone, watch this. It's a story about two guys and some cookies in an airport. <laughs> All right? That's, that's really what we're talking about here. Let's go back and see what happens with the judgment in the story. But the man seemed to have enjoyed the cookie so much, he took another one and started eating it too. This continued for a while, and with each passing moment, he began to get more and more irritated. Every time he took a cookie, so did the other man. When the last cookie was left, the man nervously took that cookie and broke it in half. He offered the other to the man and smiled. 
The man took the cookie and could not believe the other man's nerve. He was thinking in his head, how ungrateful could that man be? The other man then left and took the container with him. So you see the story, you're like, <laughs> wait, what is happening here? My cookies, man. These They're are my- disappearing quicker than I wanted. Yeah, and then the other guy, I mean, it, 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 the other guy has the nerve to split the last cookie and give you half. <laughs> and, so you, and the guy's sitting there saying, what are you doing? Those are my cookies. And, you know, I can kind of really feel the passion of this moment here. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can. You I, love cookies. I do. I love cookies. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to, back to business. So that story unfolds, and it helps us. it's going to help us to understand this in a, in a very, very profound way very, very shortly. Verse 3 of Matthew chapter 7, this sin of fault finding. We talked about the, the, the great danger of fault finding and fault magnifying. Well, the sin of fault finding, it, it's actually a three-stage process. It begins with the observation stage. Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And Rick, the word speck means a draw a dry stalk or twig, a straw or chaff. And the log means through the idea of holding up a stick of timber. You know, and the idea of holding up, you know, it, it's a it's a big enough piece of lumber to hold something up. So there's a there's a big, big hyperbole thing going on here because you've got chaff, which is kind of like dust, versus a four by eight or or a four by four or a two by eight or something like that can you know, hold something up. Something a big piece of lumber. Jesus is using hyperbole to make a profoundly important point dramatic enough to remember. He's using the exaggerated picture so it stays in your mind. The mere fact that we are fault finding classifies us as those whose own faults are painfully obvious before God. Remember the panorama from the last segment? Yes. Okay, that's what's happening here. This is clearly a position that a disciple of Christ does not want to be in. And Rick, um, I was thinking about the concept of thought, word, and deed. Mm. And I was thinking of if, you know, we catch it in our thoughts before we use words to tell others of our false preconceived ideas, you know, trying to judge someone else, you know, that's good if you catch it. But if not, it would lead to acting on our false premise. So, you know, it's a three-stage process. You think about it, you talk about it, and then you act on it. And, you know, it, that's the solution to stop it as quickly as you can. And, and that fits really well because this is the observation stage of the problem. So, you, you, like you said, stop it at the thought stage. Okay, I had that thought. Uh, okay, we don't want to go there. Let's not do that. Let's move on to something else. Exactly. But wait, Rick, hold on. If our brother does have a speck in their eye, shouldn't we point it out? After all, it'll irritate them, um, make them focus on unproductive things and even hurt their attitude. Okay. So if somebody's got a speck in their own eye, shouldn't we help them out? That's a good question. And I'm not going to answer it right yet because we're going to get to that after examining verse four. But I will say that there is a value in helping someone with a difficulty like that. There's absolutely a value, but not in the context that we're talking about here and now. Jesus is telling us we've got a problem. So in this context, no. The answer is no, you don't do it. Not here, not now. Why? Well, we're going to get back to um, Matthew in, in a moment. Let's go back to Romans 2 first. Remember, Romans and Matthew seem to work together. Matthew chapter 7, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, Jonathan, let's go to verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? See how beautiful that is, talking about what the values are that we have? See, Paul here is reminding us our most in spiritual, of our most in, uh, uh, important spiritual perspective. Be, by being arbitrary... And by fault-finding, we lose our grip on God's kindness, tolerance, and patience with us. So if we are arbitrary and fault-finding, what the Apostle Paul is saying, you combine his words with the message of Jesus, is you are choosing to go down a path that walks away from God's kindness towards you, his tolerance towards you, and his patience towards you. I don't know, Jonathan, you want to walk down that path? 
No, I don't want to walk down that path. Well, so you and I, we want to go the other way. Absolutely. We have to be careful, though, because it's too easy to get into this arbitrary judgment thing. From that, that thought with Romans, now let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. Now let's get on to verse 4, and this is going to be the second stage of fault finding. Uh, the, the sin of fault finding, the second stage, comes. The, it, this is the communication stage. We observed it, and now we communicate it. This is where we magnify the fault that we found. Just like you said before, if we would have managed it inside of our head and left it there, we wouldn't have magnified it. But no, 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 we are not happy with that. We have to magnify it. And here's what happens in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 4. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? Not only do we look at their fault, we act on their fault. Not only do we act on their fault, but we present ourselves as all holy in the process. So we have elevated ourselves in this inappropriate approach to judging our brother. There are times when judgment's appropriate. Stay tuned next segment for that. But here, we're in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So consider, consider the following points as gateways for judgment. And Rick, right before we get to those four points, we cannot judge another's heart. Only Jesus and God can do that. That means we can only judge outward actions, right? Yes, yeah. And, and, and sometimes we confuse the ability to just judge outward actions with saying, well, that means we shouldn't judge at all. No, we have a responsibility to when it's appropriate. But you're right. We can't touch the heart because we don't know the heart. So there's, there, there's three basic points here, Jonathan. Let's, let's take them one at a time. What's the first one? Is our judgment based upon clear truth rather than upon our own opinion? Okay, what am I basing my judgment on? Is it clear truth or is it what I think or what I'd like to be true perhaps? What's the second point? Is our judgment based upon a kind perspective and not out of anger, revenge, or jealousy? So we have truth and we have kindness, a kind perspective rather than anger or jealousy or something like that. What's the third point? Is our judgment a necessary judgment, or are we just stirring the pot? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Well, Rick, what if we get two out of three? That's not bad. <laughs> so which one do you want to leave out? You want to, let's, let's leave truth out. No, that's probably not a good idea. No. Let's leave kindness out. No, that's not a good Christian idea. Well, let's leave necessary out. Oh, no, that's, you can't leave any of them out. So no, two out of three in this case, not so good. We have to be clear on that. <laughs> Thanks. Look, Jesus, Jesus was no stranger to teaching us the perils of inappropriate judgment. He, this is not the only time in Matthew 7 that he talked about it. Let's look at Luke 18, verses 9 through 12. This is a parable of Jesus. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Well, Rick, it sounds to me like this is the sin of comparison. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's, he's looking at this guy and he's looking down on him and he sounds like he's having a pretty good time. Pretty good time of it. And, uh, you know, as he's standing there uh, and... And, and it says he was praying this to himself. And I think, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty appropriate. There. <laughs> it's not a good situation. See, the flood of insensitive and comparative judgments in this story are a dramatic example of where the issues Jesus laid out in Matthew 7 can lead. We keep coming back to Matthew 7 because it's such a powerful clearinghouse for making sure that we're judging appropriately and not going down this, this, this path. So let's go to verse 5, because remember we had the observation stage of, of this uh, inappropriate fault-finding. We had the communication stage. Verse 5 in the sin of fault-finding comes the revealing stage. Here are careless judgments about and exposure of another's faults are labeled, and the labeling is not pretty. And you're already nodding your head like, no, I don't it's even want to read this, but Matthew 7, 5, go ahead. You hypocrite, 
First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Well, Rick, this is a sila moment. Sila means pause and consider. The question is, am I doing this? Am I being a hypocrite? If I am, doesn't that show a lack of true humility? It does. And, and you know, the, the thing about it, Jonathan, remember you had asked uh, about earlier, we're talking about, well, shouldn't we take the speck out of our brother's eye? What does Jesus say here? He says, first you take the log out of your own eye, then you can see clearly. So get rid of the hypocritical aspect of what you're doing, then you're free to be helpful. But don't go down that, oh, I'm going to be all helpful road, when it is not a good thing, it's not healthy for anyone. The hypocrisy of verse 5 lies in the feigning of concern for the fault of another while ignoring, in a wholesale fashion, the glaring and larger fault that belongs to me. This behavior shows that we do not truly care for our neighbor, rather we care to show our superiority over our neighbor. Well, Rick, uh, how do you feel when someone falsely judges you? Yeah. It doesn't feel good, does it? No, no, it doesn't. And, you, and, and when you have that experience, it, for me, in the past, it has, it has weighed me down. Like, how could, how, could, how could you get there with this? So, no, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because we should internalize that and say, do I ever want to do that to somebody else? Let's go back to Jesus' parable with the, with the Pharisee and the tax collector, Luke 18. Now we'll read verses 13 and 14 for the other side of the story. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So there's this self-humbling that this tax collector brought with him when he went to pray. He stood a distance away because he was ashamed. He didn't even lift up his eyes to his he heaven because he was so humble and so hurt. And he was beating his breast and saying, God, I am just a sinner. And because of the humble approach, he walked away with God's graces. And that's the thing we need to remember. This simple principle of God's judgment being the only judgment that ultimately matters, because that's really what matters in this parable. It wasn't the, 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 the judgment of the Pharisee. That didn't matter at all. What mattered is this man standing before God. God's judgment is the only judgment that ultimately matters, and it also echoes, hey, how about this? Back in Romans chapter 2, going through these together because they fit so well together. Let's go back to Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. But because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgments of God, who will render to each person according to their deeds. So this is a powerful statement that takes it further than what Jesus says in Matthew. Jesus says, you hypocrite. This is says, you are storing up wrath. It's like, hey, you know what I'm collecting? I'm collecting God's wrath. I've got this big closet full, and I keep adding to it. I mean, really? <laughs> yeah, no, like, what are you doing? <laughs> but you, we don't want to go down that road. Inappropriate judgment, uh, fault-finding, fault-magnifying, those things bring God's anger to us because we are not acting as true Christians. Inappropriate judgment will always bring appropriate and, if necessary, severe response from God. Sometimes that response won't come right away, but I tell you, According to Scripture, it will come. Judging our own judgments, again, the question with a slightly different twist here, when I look at my brother's faults, what do I do? First it was, what do I see? Now, what do I do? Do I act in a way that belittles him because of my own hypocrisy, or do I act in a way that builds him up? Does my seeing his faults bring me to treating him as less than he is, or do I choose to treat him as Christ in him, the hope of glory. And now, Rick, I know we're talking about the brotherhood, followers of Christ, but let's say for principle's sake, uh, we're dealing with anyone in the world, not a brother. What should our attitude be because they also have a future hope? Yes, they do. And, and we talk about Christ in him being the brotherhood, the hope of glory. But for the rest of the world, what we say is, what we ought to look at is the ransom in them, the hope of eternal life. 
because Jesus died for them like he died for everybody else. That's the way we want to be looking at others, not with this arbitrary fault-finding, fault-magnifying judgment. Fault-finding judgment is nothing more than a trap. Let's face that fact, then turn around and run away from it. As we avoid inappropriate judgments, how do we know when and why to make proper judgments? <laughs> this is a massively important and difficult question. The Bible does tell us that some judgments are not only proper, but necessary as well. Understanding the reasons, the attitudes, and the method for these needed judgments now becomes a priority. When we judge, we must honor God as we do it. So, Jonathan, in this segment, we want to drill down on things that we absolutely need to judge once we put things in order. And the first thing we want to just remind ourselves of is what we should be made of. As followers of Christ, we should have a character that stands above scrutiny. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15 teaches us this. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he was spiritually appraised all things, yet in him self is appraised by no one. So, and Rick, this I'm sorry. No, this no, word, I was just I was gonna ask you, what does the word appraised mean? It's, it's, <laughs> oh, absolutely. It it's a different word. It um it's another word for judgment, judging. It means to scrutinize, uh, that is, by implication, investigate, interrogate, uh, determine. It's kind of like a sizing up, I guess you'd say. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to, to, to put it. And in the King James Version, it does say judgment. The Apostle Paul says in King James, yet he himself is judged by no one. It sounds like, you know, he's all, all tough. Well, oh, nobody judges me. But what he's saying is, I don't need to be sized up. Why? Because if we are Christians and we stand for Christ and we live for Christ, people around us should know what we're about. They should know what we stand for by our words and by our actions. There's no need for them to say, so what is this guy really meaning? We, our yea should be yea and our nay should be nay. We should be clear pictures as the Apostle Paul was. This character stands above the arbitrary fault-finding issues of Matthew 7 and Romans 2. So we're going to leave Matthew 7 and Romans 2 behind for now. Uh, first, let's go back to the cookie story, because it's cookies and it's important. And we, <laughs> we have the guy with the cookies, and the other guy ate half of his cookies and then left and took the empty container with him, which is, you know sounds like, well, that was pretty courteous of him, clearing off the empty container. Let's hear what the reality of the situation actually was. This guy couldn't believe what had just happened. He was relieved when his flight was called. He gathered his belongings. As he lifted his bag, he saw that there was a full container of cookies right there. He was totally shocked, totally surprised. It caught him off guard. He thought to himself, if my cookies are here, then wait, those cookies were his. The other man had shared his cookies whilst he was thinking he was the one doing the sharing. Whilst he was angry and irritated, the other man was being generous and kind. He felt so bad for what had happened, but he couldn't find the other man anywhere and didn't know how to apologize. Think about the revelation when you see the box of cookies and you say, wait a minute, what just happened here? <laughs> yeah, and then you look back and you think about all of the things you thought and the kind of the, the scowl perhaps on your face, like, who do you think you are? When all the while the guy is like, so he's eating my cookies. Oh, well, I guess we'll share. And then he <laughs> takes the last one and breaks it in half and gives it to him. How generous. It, it just is, it's an amazing little story. We'll get to the lesson from it in the next segment. Well, with this character in place, we will look at situations we as Christians should judge. With each judgment, we need to ask, why are we judging? What is our method? And what should be our attitude? Three things. Why, what's our method, and what should be our attitude? So these are things that we need to be involved in with judgment. So folks, pay close attention here because this is important now. It, it, not that everything else wasn't. <laughs> in addition to standing above scrutiny, as followers of Christ, we should be able to access God's spiritual wisdom, and apply it to judging the more basic earthly matters amongst ourselves, amongst Christians. We're taught this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Jonathan, let's do verses 1 through 3 to begin with. 
Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more of matters of this life? So let's pause there for a moment. So the Apostle Paul is saying, what are you doing? You're taking each other to court for trivial matters. Aren't you qualified to judge the trivial cases, the smaller things of legality? Don't you have qualification to judge those between yourselves? Don't you know that in the next age you're going to judge angels? Come on. Where's your, where's your spiritual strength here? He continues. Verses 4 through 7. Go ahead. So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are not account in the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brother, but brothers go to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually, then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? So he's talking about this idea of having these discrepancies within the body of Christ and taking it to court. And he's saying unequivocally, you should have at least somebody who has God's spiritual wisdom, his Holy Spirit amongst you, who can help you figure this out. And, and you know, it, it's a matter of, he's not saying you take every, every matter, because some of the bigger things need to, need to be handled in a, in a legal fashion. No question about that. Sure, sure. But the smaller things you should take care of. You should be, we should be judging between ourselves regarding basic worldly matters. So we said there's three th questions we have to ask. Well, the why of the judging, what is our method, and our attitude. So the why. Why should we be doing this? First, we should be taking care of ourselves with Christian maturity. Second, this is an important aspect of our witnessing as Christians to the world. They should see us as capable of working out our differences as unselfish followers of Jesus. This is a way that we witness to others our why. What's the method, Jonathan, that we should be looking for here? Well, find those who display Christian wisdom based on the leadings of God's Spirit. That's pretty simple, isn't it? It is. Christian wisdom, God's Spirit, helps us see things in a higher, clearer, more righteous way. That's the method. What's the attitude that we should approach these judgments between ourselves with? Well, humility on the part of the one called upon to judge and those who have the dispute. So, All three. <laughs> yeah. So no matter who's involved, you need the humility to make it work. Right. We, we show the maturity, we witness to others, we use Christian wisdom through God's Spirit, and we have that humble attitude. And, and Paul says, why not take the wrong? Just, are you that worried about earthly things that you have to be all perfect and, 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 you know, letter of the law with one another? Come on! I mean, he's, you, can, you can feel the frustration in the Apostle Paul here. So that's one example. Let's look, move to another example. Jesus tells us of, of appropriate judgment now. Jesus tells us that we have a responsibility to judge and expose false prophets. We're going to go back to Matthew 7, but several verses later, verses 15 through 20. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So when he talks about false prophets, and he's saying, you need to make judgments here. You need to judge them by their fruits. This is important. You need to identify them in the context of the body of Christ. Now, there's an interesting side point here. Jesus doesn't tell us to judge each other by our fruits, but we're only to judge false prophets by their fruits. See, we should be giving each other the benefit of the doubt. It's kind of an interesting comparison here. That is, Rick. And when it comes to def defending truth, we must make judgments. There are times we have to. And we should feel uncomfortable and not take pleasure in it. Yeah, I, I think that that's an important aspect of this thing. The, the discomfort with, do I have to judge this? Yes, I do. Okay, then I'm going to do it because it's a responsibility. So the why. 
the why of this judging of false prophets. Why? Because we're all responsible to help protect the flock from ravenous wolves. And there's a lot of scriptures that tell us that's what happens, and we have to be protective. And Jonathan, when you look at Christianity throughout the world, there's lots of Christian uh, groups that have the wrong kind of leadership that are leading them away from Christian sacrifice and toward earthly gain. So that's the why, because we're responsible. What's the method that we should use here? Close observations of those who come in among us regarding the direction of their influence. Where would this individual lead us, and how does that stack up with where Jesus leads us? And when there's a diversion, we need to be alert. And what is the attitude that we need to have here? Attentive scrutiny, always with humility. You, we must scrutinize. So yes, there are times when we judge. Absolutely. One, more, one more, more sober Christian responsibility for judgment. That's an absolute necessity. We are to judge within the brotherhood in areas, areas of serious moral issues. There is no equivocation on this. This is something we have to stand firmly upon. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You became arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. So there was immorality within the, in the Corinthian church, and they didn't do anything about it. And the Apostle Paul said, what is wrong? What is wrong here? This is not tolerable. So when we look at this, we have to understand the why, the method, and the attitude. What's the why? Well, here, here, here's the thing. Immoral activity has no place within the brotherhood. There is not an exception for that. We came from an immoral world into a sanctified body of Christ. Sanctified means set apart for a holy purpose. There's no room for immoral behavior there. And that reminds me, Rick, of come as you are, but change to become Christ-like. Right. Come as you are, don't stay as you are. And that applies to every single one of us. So the why is because we need to stay clean and be clean and be an example. What's the method of this difficult, and this is a difficult judgment, but what's the method here? Actions that are designed to humbly do what is necessary to remove the immorality from within the church. So our actions have to be designed to be humble, but straightforward. Humble doesn't mean you're a pushover. Humble means you're not full of yourself, but you're trying to act in a way that reflects godliness. And the idea is to remove the immorality from the church. Why? Because it does not belong. Now, here's the big key for all of this. Jonathan, what is the attitude that we're supposed to have with this? Mournful. Notice the focus is not on anger, but on lamenting the sinful actions. This prepares us for the possibility of of fully receiving a repentant brother back when he is ready. We generally think that the attitude here should be angry and, 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 and frustrated and passionate. But the Apostle Paul here says, you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead. You should be grieving over this circumstance. And I think this is a powerful idea for us to grab hold of and say, this is the attitude we need to have. If we are angry and fire is coming out of our eyes, we're not preparing ourselves to be able to receive someone when, when they repent. We're, the, the Corinthian church took Paul's advice. Yes. And they followed through. And yes, this repentant brother did come back and was accepted back because of stopping the immorality. Be I love that that experience to teach us what to do. And, and that's a great point. And they followed what the Apostle Paul said. And that mournful attitude is important. This is an appropriate and necessary judgment. There's no question about it. We cannot underestimate these things. So judging our judgments, when I look at my brother's faults, how do I now proceed? Jonathan? Do I rush to judgment with passion, anger, and a sense of superiority? Let me rather put these necessary judgments in place with caution when there are grievances, firmness when there is corruption, 
and sadness when there is wrongdoing. So we need to look at this and say we have to be able to judge worldly things amongst ourselves. We need to be able to judge truth teaching amongst ourselves and moral behavior amongst ourselves. Those are the things we need to appropriately judge. Proper judgment is harder than it looks. To do it right, we must stay out of the way and apply godly principles. We've considered some harder judgments. What about brotherly judgments that are more positive? Yeah, this is where it can be a little bit more fun. When we think about making judgments, it's easy to assume we're referring to the nastier side of life where principles are at stake. But there are several other types of appropriate judgments that we need to make between ourselves. These are maturity-based, and they're not necessarily right or wrong in nature. They're based on good, better, and best. And because we're imperfect, we need to understand that that level, we, we need to, to, to strive for best as best as we can. Well, we, we found a quote. I'm not sure uh, where it came from, but I really like it. It says, don't judge people for the choices they make when you don't know the options they had to choose from. Hmm. That, that makes a lot of sense because just like you, you said early in the podcast, you know, we can't touch the heart. We can't read the heart. It's, it's not ours. That's not where we can go. We can only look on the outside, and we have to be really careful. And that's why Jesus is so strong in Matthew 7. At the beginning of the podcast, we focused in on the strength of, you hypocrites, stop when you're doing these things inappropriately. So now let's look at good, appropriate Christian judgment. But first, let's finish the lessons of the story of the two men and the cookies. Things are not always as they appear. Sometimes we make quick assumptions about people, circumstances, and situations. We judge them, label them, and put them into a box, not recognizing that there is a much bigger picture. Sometimes we meet someone in a particular state, stage, or phase of their life and stereotype them to be a certain way. Don't be so quick to judge. You never know when you might find yourself walking in someone else's shoes. And remember, the best apology is changed behavior. Jonathan, you know, he said you might you never know when you find yourself walking in someone else's shoes. And mm-hmm. I might add, or eating someone else's cookies <laughs> without realizing it. It's just such yeah. a, a great lesson to, to remember. So let's focus on these positive judgments. As Christians, we are called upon to judge who should be shepherding the flock. That's a Christian responsibility. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And it goes on and gives several other qualifications. So this is something that's describing what those who are in leadership roles within the Christian church should be. Here's the decision process in early Christianity. This was a decision that had to be made in each of the local churches, and and Paul and and, and Barnabas were really working on this. So the decision process in early Christianity, Paul and Barnabas are on a missionary journey, and they are helping the local groups make these decisions. We look at that in Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 23, and this is the King James Version. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So when you read that phrase, and when they had ordained them elders in every church, it sounds like when they you know, laid their hands on and, and magically or uh, spiritually appointed them, but that's not what the word means. Jonathan, what does that word mean? This is really big. It means to be a hand reacher or voter by raising the hand that is generally to select or appoint. So this was a voting process. The elders were chosen from within the congregations. And notice there's no reference to bringing men in from elsewhere to do the job. So the the thing about this is this is a positive thing about 
the health of each local Christian church. If someone's not elected into that position of overseer or elder, whatever the, 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 the verbiage you want to use is, it doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they're not qualified for that at that point in time. If we don't elect someone that we should, hopefully, by God's grace, we see that later on, and maybe we can rectify it. So it's a, it's a growth thing. It's a maturity thing. This is a positive thing to give us spiritual health. Judging those who lead is a serious matter. Following scriptural guidelines of qualification is really important, and they're laid out for us in 1 Timothy. We just read 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 2, but it's 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. It's in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, and other places as well. It's really critical that we follow these guidelines. Well, that's one area of positive judgment, judging those who would be shepherding the flock. Another area. As Christians, we are called upon to know the truth of the gospel and to judge and respond when we see teaching that is not in line with the gospel. Now, this is different than the false prophets that we were talking about last segment. This is having to do with those who are not false prophets, but of a different perspective on certain Christian doctrines. Example, the Galatian church was being led down a road that mixed the Jewish law with the gospel. Not an appropriate mixture, and the Apostle Paul responds to it in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by, his, by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are distorting you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So the Apostle Paul is basically saying, what are you doing? You're following some other version of the gospel, which by definition can't be the gospel because the gospel only has one version. Don't go there. Don't do that. Make a judgment on what is the true gospel. Our judgments in this area should be based on our own diligence in proving what the gospel is. We are all personally responsible here. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us that. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Well, Rick, when seeing things differently, here's how it should look. I appreciate your perspective. We see it differently. That's pretty simple. <laughs> and straight to the point. You've got a knack here, brother. You've got a knack for just bring, <laughs> boiling it down and say, okay, we see it differently, and, and how can we work together when we see some things differently? Now, granted, look, there are some things that are, might be huge that may be very hard to work together with, but most of the time, they're small enough where we can figure it out if we have the humble attitude and we don't get involved in the Matthew chapter 7, Romans chapter 2, foibles of inappropriate judgment. So... <laughs> yeah, foibles. I, I yeah, like that I word. That word. <laughs> so like the way the word sounds is like foibles. It's like, wow, that's just kind of a cool word. Anyway, <laughs> next example of appropriate judgment. As, as Christians, we're called upon to not judge another's conscience in matters of preference or maturity. And again, this is not in matters of morality, but in matters of preference or maturity. Romans chapter 14, verses 2 to 4. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So... We have different perspectives and different approaches to our Christianity, and the Apostle Paul in Romans 14 is saying you have to be respectful of where Brother Jonathan is coming from, Brother Rick, who you might think you're, you're superior because you have an understanding that he doesn't have yet. Stop it already. He stands before God, newsflash, not before you. So get off your high horse and meet him eye to eye, face to face, with that right hand of fellowship working together. Our kind, understanding, and loving treatment of others in these matters is just as important as the matters of serious principle and morality. See, we don't look at these matters as so important. We're like, eh, no big deal. Yes, they are. Why? Because it all has to do with faithful discipleship. So acceptance, when there's no big moral principle, is just as important as rejection when there is immoral behavior. Wow. 
they both stand strongly before God. God looks at both of those, and we write our, our, our description of ourselves by how we handle both of those things. One last area, Jonathan, to begin to wrap up. As Christians, we're called upon to be aware of the brotherhood and their experiences. This, the verse we're going to read doesn't sound like a verse that has judgment in it, but it really does, and it's a good and powerful and healthy judgment. The judgment here in this next verse is in regard to spiritually discerning when one of our brotherhood has become entangled in activities or, or, or tendencies that bring them down the wrong road. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. So if a brother is caught in a trespass, who is supposed to go to their aid? We are. You who are spiritual. This is directly contradictory to what Matthew 7 was about, because Matthew 7 wasn't a spiritual approach, was it? No. It was a very arbitrary approach. But here is that spiritually mature approach. You who are spiritual, reach out, help them. Don't judge, help. Observe, reach out, help. Why? Because they're valuable. And you reach out because you love them and you respect them and you want to continue to have that fellowship and, 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 and co-laboring together. And, and, and it's so important for them to be healthy and you to be healthy you can't carry the burden. You can't solve their problem. And folks, let's make sure we understand that. We cannot solve one another's problems. We can't do that. But we can help somebody to get on the road where they can, by God's grace, find those solutions. So Jonathan, as we look at this now, our final judging our judgments. When I look at the brotherhood's experiences, the experiences of now of, of the brotherhood, how do I contribute do I realize the importance of my own spiritually diligent contribution? Along with the whole body, I am tasked with discerning strong leadership, the purity of the gospel, the power of conscience, and the necessity of mutual support. Well, Rick, when we help someone, we should ask ourselves, one, what's my attitude? Two, what's the circumstance? And three, how do I build up? And Jonathan, the question you asked early on, one of the questions you asked early on on the podcast was, well, I know we're talking about the body of Christ, but what about the everybody else? And those three principles that you just mentioned and the principles of the scripture apply on every level. So just re re restate those three principles again, and we're going to wrap this up. What's my attitude? What's the circumstance? How do I build up? If we can approach the judgment that we need to make with those principles, folks, think about the difference that will happen in not only our lives, but in the lives of those around us, in the lives of those with whom we have a lot to do. Judgment then becomes a valuable tool of building, of maturity, of fellowship, of co-laboring, rather than a, a, a weapon of destruction. See, applying Christian principles makes that work. Applying our gut reactions makes it destructive decide how you are going to approach the idea of judgments in the experiences of your life. Think about it. Folks, listen, we really want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our podcast is subscribing to Christian Questions in your favorite podcast channel, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts. Wherever you get your podcasts, please rate us and review us. We greatly appreciate it. Next week, coming up next week. Now, this is going to be an odd title, so stay with me on this. Can I get what I want through seduction? Now, why are we talking about seduction on Christian questions? Because it's something that needs to be said. Talk to you next week.